Thank you, Professor. Uh, hello to everyone. I am Rabia Bindicu, uh, an assistant student at the Smart Cities and Digital Ecosystems Lab. Uh, I sincerely welcome you to this seminar, which will be uh, given by the uh, Dr. Murat Tanık. Uh, this is the seventh of the seminar series organized by the Top Ed to the Smart Cities and Digital Ecosystems Lab. Uh, the talk will take around 45 minutes. Approximately in every two weeks, we will have distinguished uh, speakers all around the world. Uh, to introduce our speaker today, I first give the word to the Professor Dr. Mehmet Akshit, uh, who is the head of our lab. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Javier. Hello to everyone. Uh, so it is my honor to introduce uh, uh, Professor Murat Tonuk, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he has always a very special place in my uh, career, um, a very good friend, but also an excellent researcher. Uh, Professor Tonuk joined the UAB School of Engineering in 1998 as a professor from the University of Texas at Austin. He currently holds the uh, we are Ban and all chair position at UAB. Prior, prior to academic positions, he has worked on related research topics for NASA, Arthur A. Collins, uh, and ISS, ISSI. Uh, Professor Tanak is co founder of the Interdisciplinary and International Society for Design and Process Science. His publications include co-authoring of uh, many books, scientific uh, uh, contributions, uh, uh, and of course, uh, um, he has been also as, uh, very active in the uh, design and process science organization. Uh, my personal uh, uh, opinion about Professor Tanak is he is a really no-nonsense person. So he doesn't like uh, nonsense. Uh, he always searches for the essentials. He tries to understand the fundamentals. He doesn't uh, like to be, uh, you know, following uh, hypes and uh, um, let me say populism. Uh, and uh, uh, in, from that perspective, I think uh, I appreciate his uh, attitude very much. So uh, I'm very much actually excited to have this talk because this talk will be about um, his, uh, I think a dream or he, what he has been thinking for a long time uh, and we will see it very soon. So uh, very welcome to be with us and uh, please go ahead with your talk. Thank you, uh, Dr. Akshit. You also have a special place in my life and career. You have been so much helpful for the progress and, uh, and the development of society for design and process science. You play a significant role in software engineering and uh, you've been awarded STPS medals in that area uh, together with Professor Rama Murthy and uh, Dr. Ye and this is uh, unbelievable accomplishments and i'm so happy that you're helping in turkey now young generation to appreciate this type of work you know thank you for the invitation and i'll uh, today i'm going to talk about my research that i have been doing about uh, 50 years five zero <laughs> It's not a joke. <laughs> it has to be a, it's, it's a very long and convoluted journey. And I'd like to, before I start, I'd like to give you a perspective because in one a lecture, or if we, if we choose month long lecture that we can give, say every other day, I can probably cover these things. It's a very long convoluted journey, like I said, it took 50 years of work. And then three components of this work. 
uh, accidentally happened and then eventually converged to recent results. A first component was 1972, a colleague of mine, a, I mean, 72, a student, obviously, a, a, a PhD student in computer science, who already have a PhD in math, asked me a question. So do you know N Queens problem? I said, no. Then he explained to me the N Queens problem. Uh, if you don't know, it's uh, simply putting uh, eight, let's say eight queens on a chessboard so that they won't attack each other. Famous characters work on this, look at this problem, including Gauss. So you can uh, Google it and there's a, even Wikipedia page these days. In those days, they didn't have, recently they have a Wikipedia page on N queens. It's not complete, but it's not bad. <laughs> so that, that is one part. One component that I start looking into that problem early on. It turned out that I connected that problem, uh, the Dark Trust Five Philosophers problem during my dissertation. And because the situation, my advisor asked me, can you uh, solve deadlock prevention problem? Not detection, prevention. Because he says in the big networks, we cannot do busy waiting and all kinds of things for deadlock we have to prevent ahead of time. So you have to come up with an idea. It turns out that the, if you uh, slightly modify Anquin's problem, give a, a deadlock free paths. That was my PhD dissertation. So I started with, this is one thread of this problem. When I graduate, my advisor took me to Mr. Collins's company. Of course, you know, 1977, with a PhD in computer science and engineering, everybody wants to hire you because there is only probably five PhDs in the United States. There is not many those years. Everybody wants to hire you. So my advisor said, you know, I'll take you to Dallas from College Station to a special person. He took me to Mr. Collins, founder of Collins Radio Company. He had just started design a company to design next generation computer networks and network operating systems. It turned out they hired me and I start working. This was my second schooling. You know, real schooling was there. For a decade while working at, a, a, at a, a Mr. Collins's company, a, we designed network operating systems. What I didn't know at the time, Mr. Collins was using Shannon's model to create his operating system. I was just a guy working there and I didn't know anything about Shannon really, maybe just a name, maybe even not that. So I learned without knowing a, the Shannon's a communication channel ideas in a very deep way because we were writing our programs in three different ways. We call a group of programs communication channel we a group of programs memory channel and group of programs we call a, a communication and the processor channel. Then we have three types of programs. I was working on the communication channel programs. That's all. I never question why we call these things communication channel, memory channel, and processor channel. They just work there. So that's the second thread, not connected to the first one. The third thread happened 1989. 1989, Dr. Ye again arranged me to work with, to go to Naval Postgraduate School uh, to, to do some summer work. Uh, Richard Hemming was there. So by that time, I had written my research book on uh, my dream was to create a, 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 an environment for automatic program generation. And then all the mathematics necessary for it, I reviewed in that book. Okay. And <laughs> I take the book to uh, the Richard Hemming, uh, this, the guy, this Hemming code guy that uh, some of you might know, uh, old man at the time, he was interested to listen to me. So he started meeting with me every week, once a week. And then we start talking. He, he said, I at the end of that month uh, or in the middle, he said, I like your book, but you know what's missing? Communication theory is missing in your book. 
you should cover it. I'm thinking, old man, what do you know? You know, great timing, I'm saying. Communication. What does communication theory has anything to do designing next generation computer systems, network systems and stuff that I'm trying to do? I, I'm gonna use algebraic systems, come on. What is communication, right? But he put the bug in my head. This is 1989, and that's the third thread. When I was uh, starting uh, studying uh, the Hemings idea of communication, all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, uh, Mr. Collins was designing his system using communication theory. I connected uh, communication theory with, uh, with the work we have been doing all those years. And then, for some reason, I don't know, because Queen is always in my mind from the old days, <laughs> I connected that the uh, and Queen's problem also. And that's the story. It took 50 years. But connecting the uh, old and Queen's problem, the uh, and Queen's problem is a string of permutations. That's all there is to it, strings of permutations. And uh, connecting with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the the applications of the communication channel and the theory of the communication channel. This talk is about that. That's why it is convoluted. It took a long time, but finally I was able to apply it to many things. And then even more things, especially very practical one, relatively easily can be engineered is room temperature a, a super a, a, we call it hyperconductivity room temperature you can guess what, how big that can be okay a, that is a, that requires about i anticipate 18 months a, about 10 million dollars so maybe a little more than that but i did that kind of projects that's not a big deal a, you know the year 2000 a, we, we develop a Okay. for $10 million in, in about 80, less than 18 months, a cell phone provisioning system that so that your cell phones can work when the moment you purchase dynamically connects to the, uh, so, uh, the, 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 uh, the cell phone uh, uh, price uh, networks as well as connectivity networks. This wasn't possible before we invented this technology. So it's not, it's not a big deal to have that kind of thing. Okay, I'm gonna start. Do you have any questions? You can always stop me and ask me because this is kind of a uh, informal talk and I want people to understand what I'm saying rather than bragging about, I did this, I did that. Uh, Marat? Yes. You forgot something. Yes, professor. Uh, you were at, you were trying to figure out n queens on a chessboard, and your wife figured it out, and you couldn't. You <laughs> that was a nice story. Uh, maybe we should tell that <laughs> some other time. You know, it, it, well, I guess I'll tell you in one minute because now people get curious. Uh, when when my friend asked me n queens. What do you know, Hank Quinn's problem? I didn't know. He explained. So I go to my office, put a piece of paper and a pen and try to solve the problem. Case eight. And I couldn't solve it. You know, I worked maybe one hour or something. I could not put the Queens by hand on a piece of paper. So I went home and I asked my wife, do you know Hank Quinn's problem? She said, no. <laughs> okay, they, they just put the Queens on a chessboard, eight Queens on a chessboard. She says, okay. How does Queens move? You mind me. <laughs> I said, okay, this is how Queens move. And then I put a chessboard this time, not piece of paper, a bunch of uh, pawns, eight of them. And then she sold it in about maybe five minutes or something. She put everything on it, she, boom, done. After that, I decided I have to study this problem to beat my wife. That's Stanley's joke. Okay, so let's go to the <laughs> That's true story. My talk, my talk I, I labeled for this presentation, a new mathematical framework using communication channel formulas. And the, this presentation 
use so many people's, uh, so many colleagues' works. Of course, these are my papers. I am an author in every one of them. But uh, the students, my colleagues, they all work. Uh, we can make this detail. A presentation benefit from these doctoral thesis. I have about multiple, many doctoral thesis pretty much use the same technique. When I was at Collins, I was using Anquins quite a bit without telling anybody that that's the Anquins problem. I just use it for optimality purposes, okay? So these are the, now this is the book I was talking about. That's the Hemings comment, okay? And this is when I visiting with Einstein in London Wax Museum. You know, I presented my <laughs> project to him. <laughs> he liked it. <laughs> so he says, it's good, you know, I like it. I dedicate this presentation. Odi Daniel asked me the Queen's problem. Dr. Ye, my grand mentor, put the Nobel Prize bug in my head. One day he said, in year 2000, bro, are you kidding? What is this? You can get Nobel Prize with this. At the time, as a computer guy, I have no idea what Nobel Prize is. Still, I don't. But uh, it appears to be that there is some uh, information here that uh, can be worth it. All right, here is the very important, 1951, Einstein said this, 56 he died. Until the day he died, he was working on one problem. This, I want to read this quote with your permission. All 50 years conscious brooding have brought me no closer to answer to the question, what are light quanta? So he was trying to understand light quanta. In other words, photon. He was trying to understand what the hell photon is. Of course, today, every rascal thinks he knows the answer, but he is deluding himself. This is also true today. You know, people think they know photon. <laughs> so, but <laughs> like Einstein says, there is more to it. Therefore, this is a, you know, we can do another recording session if you care, man. man. So let's say, what are the light quanta? He was wondering about this. The answer is, so next slide. This one, what are light quanta Einstein ask? I have an answer. They are communication channel systems looking like that. That's what photon is actually. And I'll show you why. First of all, we have to understand some fundamentals. I know that everybody's fundamental is, is different layer. Depends on where they work all their life. You know, my fundamental layers also change. When I was working for NASA, Texas A&M University, NASA Research Center, my fundamentals were learning everything about software engineering. That's anything below, I don't care about. So, but in, in, uh, in science, from the con concept of fundamentals is different. Frank Wilczek, he's a colleague of mine, okay, uh, works. Uh, he wrote a book recently called Fundamentals. Einstein called fundamental theories first principle theories. Instead of fundamental, he used the word first principle theories. He says there are very few first principle theories. Here are the first principle theories. First principle theories, essentially two kinds, a particle behavior explaining projects and wave behavior explaining models. These models, particle models and wave models evolved over time it's starting with Galileo Galilei, uh, the uh, particle theories, and evolving to Newton, Einstein, between, of course, Newton and Einstein, a whole bunch of people. There's Lagrange, Hamilton, all kinds of people. Of course, uh, before and uh, uh, after Einstein, there are others. But the key people are these guys on the particle behavior. Assumption is that the world is composed of tiny particles for computational modeling purposes, which means if there is, if we want to study sun and planets, we assume sun is a point and the planets are points and they connect in a straight line and they attract each other. That is the assumption. So the point representation and this point representation we call particle representation comes all the way to particle physics. 
today, uh, particle physics uh, beautifully explains many events using particle model. But between uh, in mid 1800, there was a problem with the particle model because the people were studying light and they realized that the light uh, cannot obey as Newton claimed, he called particles corpuscles, uh, as Newton believed wasn't like particle. So the reason they noticed that when they did the double slit experiment, the two holes shining the light, they interfere. Interference patterns appeared and particles don't do that in those days. <laughs> so they said the uh, light is, must be like a wave. And of course, then our good guy, Faraday came, Maxwell and Einstein plays a role here too. They develop a wave theory. That means now we have, if I go to world, bring all the technical books, pile it one place. And I look at the equations, not bunch of words, equations. And then some equations use particle model, I pile it here. Some equations use wave model, I pile it here. So I'm going to have two big piles in all the technical books, engineering, uh, physics, chemistry, doesn't matter. There will be only two piles. Now, some of you will object to that. Say, Professor Tanik, you forget how about quantum mechanics? I say, oh, you're right. OK, let's pull quantum mechanics books from these piles and start looking at them. Some chapters in quantum mechanics represented with particle model. So I put them here. I just tear the chapters out because, you know, uh, then wave, wave chapters here. So even quantum mechanics will be, mathematically speaking, either wave or particle model. That's, that's it. There is no other model to represent natural events in the world. So that is the current state of matters. <clears throat> Next question is, is it possible to have another model? Well, now again, we have to follow Einstein's lead. Einstein says the mathematical models are the evolution of everyday ideas. For example, particle is an everyday idea. You can show a kid, oh, this is a particle. They can get it. That, that's why one of the first ideas were particle. Wave is an everyday idea also. You can see the waves interfering in the, in the pond so when you throw a stone. Therefore, a, a, a following Einstein's lead, he says, if we take an everyday idea and present it with mathematics, that's where our natural models evolve. That's why we have the models and the particle models, he says. How about a new idea, everyday idea, which today everybody familiar because of cell phone. And you communicate all the time. Because you communicate all the time, it's kind of everyday idea now, maybe not 50 years ago, but now everyday idea, communicate. Can we take communicate, communication, and make it mathematical enough to represent natural events? That's the challenge. It turns out, as I told you, because of historical accidents happen, it is possible. Let me play a little scenario with words uh, to, to represent this uh, doability of this modeling. In the heavens, there was a table. Around the table, there was a, some of these great guys. Newton was sitting, Einstein was sitting, uh, Maxwell was sitting. At, they were just chatting about the natural events. The angels come and ask, Mr. Newton, we have a question for you. You have this particle model nailed down. Uh, can you also take, you know, if I send you a, some kind of an X-ray or something. Can you also represent that like a wave? Maxwell say, uh, Newton says, no, are you kidding me? 
everything is particle. Particles hit somebody's body, make a hole. And I can calculate the damage there. But anything else, how about like other things? Maxwell said, Newton says, what do you mean other things? You know, things hit to other things and call energy transfer and this happens. And I have equations for that. And then a, they go to, angels go to Maxwell. Mr. Maxwell, if I, like one of Newton's bullets to hit somebody in the chest, what happens? He says, come on, what bullets? You know, everything is energy, radiation. How about tell me X-ray? You ask Newton, I'll handle it. You send me the X-ray, uh, somebody's chest, I can calculate the energy transfer and all these things uh, associated with it. Shannon raises his hand because Shannon by that time read some of our articles and uh, read a little bit more on Einstein's leads and things like that on communication theory, not just applications to uh, sending messages, okay? He says, what about information, guys? When a bullet hits a Nifton's guy, it's only not only transferring the energy, but associated with it, passing some information, so, such as for example, uh, various kinds of burn patterns, or what kind of bullet it is, all this information transfer, not just just the big hole in the body. Same with the X-ray. Then it says, okay, in the X-ray, you can also have all kinds of information. Therefore, he says, all these events, bullet hitting somebody's chest, X-ray uh, exposed to somebody is a form of communication. Happens to be concentrated as a bullet or spread like a wave in the case of uh, the, the X-ray. But nevertheless, this is a communication system. The key is, uh, Shannon says, you have to figure out to make it mathematical so that uh, we should be able to represent the particle and the wave using this communication idea. Then I'll believe you. So the, the answer that Einstein was looking when, remember constant brooding uh, about the photon, you were saying? He tried to understand photon to, to answer the question of uh, energy levels of the electron. And also remember the photoelectric effect 1905, March, uh, he published that photoelectric effect paper. They connected the quantum mechanics to to and then eventually come up with the idea of photon energy equals h times frequency thing. In all those things he was thinking, I would like to take the electromagnetic. A let me take it. I would like to take electromagnetic theory. This is electromagnetic from the waves, a, the radio waves all the way, very long wavelengths, and the very short wavelengths right here, gamma ray. Electromagnetic spectrum goes from here to here. Visible light is right here between 400 to 800 uh, nanometers wavelength. Right here, tiniest friction is our visible light, the, that what we call light as human beings. But the whole electromagnetic spectrum from very long wavelengths, radio waves and everything, and very short wavelengths, X-rays and eventually gamma rays. Gamma rays almost like a particle. All these things governed by the Maxwell equations. Maxwell come up with this uh, equations following Faraday's lead. Faraday come up with the idea of what we call field. In parentheses, I can tell you that all uh, physics now explained by fields, including particles. We can do field representations. Then I'll, I'll tell you a few words about fields too. You know, just like a, the just like atoms, energy levels quantized. It turns out fields are quantized. A quantization of the fields initially, uh, initially thought of by Dirac, the physicist guy, and then eventually the Feynman uh, used that quantization to develop quantum electrodynamics, which is the extension of electromagnetic theory. To, to the, the quantum realm, interactions of the light with material, 
Okay, that's what uh, Feynman did. But the, the key idea is fields. You don't forget that. So it, it ends here. Now the question is again, remember, go to the heavens. God makes all these things, right? Some people say so. Okay, let's take that for real. Uh, then God decides, I'm going to make a theory of electromagnetics starting from long wavelengths, all the gamma ray, and I'm going to stop there. No more electromagnetic theory. And then people notice that there are other things like after the gamma ray, such as electron particles. And then when you pass these particles through a hole, shows a wave nature, waves doesn't end here. Then how come electromagnetic theory ends? <laughs> we, we teach it that electromagnetic theory covers everything. Well, it turns out that electromagnetic theory ends somewhere. And there is a reason because electromagnetic theory has some conditions which cannot continue because uh, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, so here is, the next thing is they say electron. Again, God says, okay, to confuse these humans, although electron has wave nature and some particle nature too, I'm gonna make a new theory for it. It's a particle theories. And then God makes these particle theories and in, in humans start working on particle theories to explain some of these particles here, electrons such as here and some of atom properties. And then, of course, God is God, not stop there. <laughs> there are a bunch of molecules interacting, making chemicals and things, although we know they are waves, okay, because we can demonstrate in the lab. God says, I'm going to make a new theory for it, called chemicals, chemistry. And it's a descriptive theory, it turns out. Chemistry is a descriptive theory, it's not fundamental. Everything chemical can be represented, what we call quantum electrodynamics, okay? A, theoretically, you can represent all chemical equations using quantum electrodynamics. But a, this is how God decides things, okay? So all these molecular interactions, making chemical things, God makes the theory of chemistry. Then comes more complex organisms, more complex things, which we call living things, which respond to their environments with a secondary programs called genetics, okay? A, not just second law thermodynamics, but additional a, organizational uh, properties living organisms have is biology. God says, I'm gonna make new rules for it. It's called biology. So if you notice, Einstein was trying to extend this electromagnetic theory because he noticed, a, at least in his mind's head, because experimentally wasn't proven at the time, have wave properties in all these spectrum, all the way to living organisms. In fact, quantum mechanics hypothesized that using Schrodinger's equation, all these things waves, but he says probabilistically interpret. That's how a far we came today. So all these disparate theories has to have something common. What is this common thing among all these theories, uh, which we can, Einstein trying to extend electromagnetics, uh, similar to the electromagnetics waves progress. We made some progress all the way uh, to chemistry a little bit uh, using QED, the quantum electrodynamics, essentially some kind of quantum mechanics, which represents wave and particle interactions. And it, it includes special theory of relativity. Don't get upset about the word relativity. There are only two kinds, special theory and general theory. The only difference, only fundamental difference between the two, one is a motion is not accelerated. First one. The second one, motion is accelerated, acceleration. Acceleration is the key here. It, you're gonna find out that we, uh, acceleration will be the essential element on a uh, communication theory. Why it is uh, uh, so, I have to tell you a little bit story about Galileo. Galileo was experimenting in inclined planes, how things fall. What he discovered is that 
Then you, uh, uh, acceleration goes with odd numbers, odd numbers. One clock tick, uh, the accelerating object, falling object, uh, goes uh, one unit. Second clock tick goes three units. Third clock tick goes five units. So one, three, five. Fourth clock tick goes seven units. So if you add one, three, five, seven, you have four clock ticks. So clock ticks number four squared, 16. Those adds to 16. That square of the clock ticks or distance is what acceleration is. And you're going to find out, we, you know, an implication of this theory, which I'm not going to cover today is this. People who know a uh, physics a little bit, you know, uh, physics 101, right? Uh, they, they know uh, acceleration and also force equals mass times acceleration equations for uh, uh, Newton. They know M1 times M2 divided by R squared equations on Newton. This is called inverse square law. Inverse square law. Remember, I'm warning you, square is acceleration. That's not what textbook says, but I just show you that square is acceleration distance. R is the distance between two points. Keep the acceleration in your head. The next thing is you study separately. Uh, you know, we, we study Holiday and Resnick book one and two. First book, they show the M1 times M2 divided by R squared. Second book is electricity. They show Q1 times Q2 divided by R squared again. And this is Coulomb's law. Charges attract each other. Divided by R squared. Again, the distance R. Don't forget again, this is acceleration, okay? So it turns out that, it turns out that textbook says these two equations are not related. They, because by using the, the models, I'm telling you, the model here, model here, model there, by using the, the models, uh, they will develop differently. Therefore, there is no commonality between these two inverse square laws. That's your today's knowledge. Our theory shows that's not true. Because if you, if everything is a field, uh, the Faraday's field lines, which today is accepted, okay? But are field lines quantized? Are field lines structured? If they are, how they are structured? First approximation done by Dirac and Feynman. But this structure, when they structure the fields, they think that the fields are infinite lines. As a result, they run into infinity problems. It turns out that that's not the case. If you take the distance, for example, and then put another one, make a square, distance square. That is the going to be used in your square law. If you look at Google or somewhere, they will show you this square goes farther and back. So the number of slices on the square is the a number of precisions. If we represent this square, inverse square law with a square, and then if you find on it the least action, the best possible way, nature does everything as a least action. Least action ways, plot it on it. Then as the number of slices increase, precision increase. Therefore, we don't need infinity to, uh, to uh, characterize uh, the fields, uh, fields uh, uh, quantization. So all I'm saying is that uh, implications of this kind of theory, uh, which is works with finite numbers rather than infinities, there is no calculus here. There is no differential equations here because they are not uh, quote unquote correct to the highest possible precision, they are approximation. They have to be by very nature of the uh, establishment of differential equations. Therefore, we have to work with discrete models. And Einstein tried, but he, they didn't have any mathematics for it. So he, he ended up using the, the known mathematics at the time. Okay, so this is the kind of mathematics I have to use. Okay, A, the key, uh, 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 here is the uniform polygons. This is where, when I was studying the Queen's problem, they came up. 
okay? A, a representation of the polygons with a Fourier series was published elsewhere. Some, some other mathematician, I modified it. Then we use the quantum numbers for it. Uh, for some value, eigenvalue problems, I have to do the Chebyshev polynomials thing. And of course the, the Queen solutions. This is what happened. We take this Fourier series uh, form uh, and then apply the uniform polygons. Uniform polygons n taking, n is the number of nodes and this number is the jump, jump steps, okay? And then you can represent this as a Fourier series. How did I do it? It's a, I did in a very weird way, okay? Like, remember, I'm not a physicist, I'm not a mathematician, I'm a computer guy. And my goal is to make computers, right? And networks and things like that. So I have to learn these things, uh, you know, little pieces of physics, little pieces of this and that. So my knowledge only in the areas that was interesting. So one interesting area was the quantum numbers. So I look at the, uh, look at the, uh, look at the uh, periodic table starting from uh, hydrogen helium up is going like this. Uh, the number of electrons increasing is going like this. And then there are uh, notes in the physics books, uh, the Broglie waves and the, the Bohr's models and things like that. By thinking all those things, I said, can I represent these uh, uh, quantum, this uh, Planck length increments Bohr was uh, showing like this uh, helical thing. Uh, can I represent the uh, periodic table like this? Uh, which I did, okay? And now we have a paper on that in detail, all, every one of them calculated. And then we also take the actual measurements of other people do and then map our model to their measurements. So in other words, we were able to represent periodic table energy levels and the size of the atom using our model. And uh, previously, these things are not done that way uh, and that precisely. So, uh, so that's why I, I, I try to use the quantum numbers using this Fourier series. Fourier series, bunch of, you can represent any curve with Fourier series, so no matter what kind of curve, is it a polygonal, uh, so tooth and everything, anybody study electrical engineering 101 knows that a Fourier series are utilized. In fact, in your cell phones, there is a DSP chip which does Fourier uh, transform. Fourier transform, uh, I'll get to that in a moment, okay? So this Fourier series of uniform polygon uh, with the quantum numbers becomes like this. That is my equation. This equation becomes uh, this is the orbital number. This is the uh, subshell number. And all these things automatically calculated. When you combine all these in average, Schrodinger equation comes. Schrodinger equation predicts where the, uh, approximately where the, the electron going to be around the, uh, uh, around the nucleus. Uh, when you solve the Schrodinger equation, you get one value. That's approximately uh, electron will be around that range. But he doesn't have any precise points where where these things because a, that's the nature of probabilistic interpretation of the Schrodinger's wave equation. So these are details under the Schrodinger's wave equation. So when you combine this into a matrix form, this is what we have. There are three dots here. This is a matrix. In this matrix can be written like this too. Okay. It's a dynamic thing. See, if you notice all these parameters, each uh, element of the matrix is also equation. And this the matrix can represent cylindrical shapes, pretty close to cylindrical shape, which represents electromagnetic wave transmission or represents conical shape. It turns out electromagnetic theory cannot cover everything because representation is cylindrical. Nature is, as the particle becomes, more high frequency, the middle of the uh, cylinder squeeze. You know, they get smaller and smaller and smaller because frequency increase. As a result, instead of cylinder, uh, become some uh, double cone. That's why photons shape is this. Uh, many things shapes, are, many objects shapes are like that. Okay, so this matrix, it turns out 
is a general case of fast Fourier transform. If you take a fast Fourier transform matrix one, these values will be ones, these values will be ones, and rest will be some form of e to the uh, number. Uh, anybody looks at fast Fourier matrix, uh, you can see it in the, if you Google it, okay? So this, uh, this is the main contribution of the work actually, but it took, uh, but, uh, after I come up with this matrix, another uh, maybe 20, 30 years to figure out what the hell this matrix was. It wasn't that uh, easy for me to figure out, even after I make matrix to figure out what is this thing. Uh, so, the, this is how we calculate the U matrix numbers. Okay, the, the, this is the, these are the values. This is done before. Of course, we take these things, put the parameterized that uh, summation. Like I said before, this is a, it, you know, if you wanna make next generation quantum computer, most likely we're gonna utilize polarization. Okay, a, this will be a quantum, and classical computer because it works both ways, okay? This is electromagnetic waves progressing and then it, in the elliptical polarization, this image in elliptical in the back. So if you notice, this is like a cylindrical shape. And, but the reality uh, uh, in this case, let me go next slide. It's, it, this is the way as, as they become particle, the middle part gets narrower and narrower. It's no more cylinder anymore. So how can we analyze this shape? The way to analyze it, that's where our queens and everything else for the series comes. If you look at that cylinder from top right here, you see this shape, these vibrations you see. As you increase the frequency of these vibrations, they became very, very high frequency and it becomes like a line. See, this is like a line. It's not line, it is a, a Fourier series. Here, Fourier series, Fourier series, same as Fourier series. Only difference is that this is the equation for this Fourier series. This is the equation for this Fourier series. So what we can say then, this communication model that I show with that matrix can represent these both ways. How does it happen? This is a channel. Communi this is Shannon's communication channel. Shannon's communication channel can be represented as a polygon. You can take A goes to B, A goes to B, B goes to C, B goes to C. So you can represent this channel. These are noisy paths. These are no noise, right? This, this is called noisy communication channel. <laughs> it turns out that when you plot the Queen's solutions, such a weird thing, okay? and take these queen solutions represent like a channel. Okay, here is one goes to one, two goes to three, two goes to three, that one, and three goes to five, three goes to five, that one. So if you represent, this is a noisy communication channel represented by these queen sets, okay? Well, it turns out that this kind of channels are least action channels. Shannon has a theorem for it. Okay, but this is not. This is a least action channel. As a graph, we can represent this like that. Einstein commented to his Nobel laureate, Otto Stern, I have taught a hundred times much more about the quantum problems as I have about relativity theory. You know, this is a wonderful book. I take this quote from there. Uh, it's in the letters that he wrote letters. I have a little book, Einstein's letters. It must be there too, but I, I just look at from this book. And in this book, it's a nice book, you know, very few good books in this area. And I had, so Einstein was saying, again, this is around fifties. He says, look, I tried this, the quantum problem, which is photon to, to figure out what photon is you know, a, instead of relativity theory. Well, it turns out that the relativity theory inside these things, I didn't get into it. You know, my colleague, Dr. Skidmore, who is a, the, one of the early inventors of MRI, 
a, he and I, we work together, okay? And then he makes a lot of uh, developments in that area. So we're coming up with uh, calculating fine structure constant with this model. It turns out that the pi, uh, the value E, there is number E pops up from these natural things as well as pi. Very, very interesting work when you consider the relativity, general theory of relativity uh, in these models. So that's what he's doing. Uh, this picture, my colleague, uh, uh, Frank Wilczek, you know, he got the STPS medal on helping the public to understand physics. And uh, the, uh, we are going to uh, write our uh, paper. We wrote the paper we're gonna submit like uh, uh, in March. The reason March, because uh, Einstein submitted his paper uh, this quanta paper in March of 1905. So I thought that it would be nice if we can do that too. Okay, that's uh, three, four minutes left. I think I am done, let me see, yeah. So do you have any questions for me? Uh, I'll be happy to answer, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate very much. Uh, so uh, indeed, if there are questions, so uh, uh, I, I, I have, uh, of course, a lot of questions, uh, but possibly uh, uh, not all of them are wise questions. Let me put it this way. Uh, maybe we shall, maybe uh, Professor I, take it over. Do you have a yeah, question? Yeah, I have a question. Hocam merhabalar, Murat Hocam. Evet, hocam. Yeah, selam, I saw you. Selam. Yeah, long time no see, so good to yeah. see you again. Yeah. So, uh, let me ask one question before I go, because I have at four o'clock an important meeting. Okay. Uh, so, so obviously for us it's quite sad. So this is a, a still a, from the systems thinking perspective, they are now trends towards um, what they uh, uh, say, like the theories so far have focused on reductionistic thinking. Right? Yes. Uh, we, we split up the, uh, the system into particles in this case, yes. or elements or waves, and then try to make sense of the world. Yes. But the, the, so that's the, the one way of thinking. But the other way of thinking is, is a more uh, systems thinking, where you focus on the relations, right? And then that, that yes. provides a more holistic perspective. That's correct. Uh, yeah. How do you position the, the uh, ideas and thoughts about this dual uh, theories of uh, particles and waves, which is actually also kind of paradoxical, but Right, so still, but how do you see the systems thinking approach in the whole uh, things that you have explained, right? Yes, wonderful, very good question. Uh, remember, uh, I was, I, I even maybe write papers, uh, conference papers and talks uh, against the uh, silos of knowledge and the, and the holistic thinking's necessity of the holistic thinking. Uh, thinking along those lines leads us to this way, because communication theory, that particular cone, represents either way. In fact, we find out that when you make, uh, when you look from the outside, we're using relativity now, and then from the inside as well, uh, there is a moment uh, when you look backwards, you see from the moment the electron, and then you look forward you see the, 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 uh, the proton. And then when this, this moment moves, electron coming from behind, proton going from the uh, front. So if we should have the, in a moment, we have the past and we have the future at the same time. At the same time. Just the moment time. Because see, you can even imagine that. You say, I would like to get up. Okay, but you didn't get up yet. You're thinking to get up. When you get up, you did get up. That's history now, <laughs> right? So uh, quantum mechanics tells us this, but doesn't have a precise calculations. We can have a moment. Moment is so fast that below, uh, uh, below, uh, below uh, uh, the Planck length, Planck time. Therefore, a moment, when you move, the moment uh, becomes history. And that's detectable. 
but the moment not detectable because you're in the moment. You know, when you move, because our theory suggests that, uh, you know, the universe is expanding according to the current theories uh, uh, after the Big Bang ex expanding uh, all over the places, uh, uh, it's called uh, uh, isotropically. Uh, our theory says, no, uh, there are a few other people said that the uh, universe is expanding unisotropically, directionally. And there are many, many indicatings, indications of directionality, including for our, our bodies, for example, why left-handed proteins we are we were made up with instead of right-handed proteins. There are a whole bunch of other reasons. But uh, let me tell you one more the basic thing intuitively. If, you, if you're going one direction, and you, if you can see only the history, because you cannot see the future, right? And you look up, the, uh, it's, it's things coming down on you, and you can only see the history. You look back, you see that, oh, everything is expanding. Is it really? Or you're the one sinking? If you're sinking, you see everything is expanding. That's uh, the, if, if it is a rotational acceleration going down like this, give the illusion that everything is extending. As a result, people say, you know, everything's extending, who's pulling it? What, what, what kind of things pull these guys? It all must be something. What is that something? Oh, black something, black energy, black hole, black whatever. <laughs> no, there is nothing out there because it's not expanding. It's, it is expanding illusion is we're falling. That's what we can see the history like that. that right. was, you see, uh, this model also, we don't talk about these things and write about these things because people, because it's too, too, we don't have a calculation of it. That's why we only want to talk about things we calculate. Yeah, so, the, co the question is that you can't have calculations, right? So related to this is also what we see like uh, the complex adaptive systems, right? So there are like different categories of problems. Some some problems you can indeed formalize, right? And map to, to equations and try to make sense of this. So complicated, but, and it's so we have also lots of, or on the one hand, or perception, we have different perception. On the other hand, the nature is also quite really complex, right? And then say like, okay. uh, so we need to also acknowledge that we cannot grasp reality in its full extent. Uh, and for that, we can maybe look at these scenarios or, or we can play, right? So we have like what the, the category is like simple, complicated, complex, chaotic, right? So mm -hmm. what the- uh, I use, yeah. a, a, I use a, 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 the Herb Simon's definition, complex systems versus complicated systems. A complicated systems could be like space station or, or airplane. Yes. You can yeah. bring the airplane into single screw. I un undo all the screws up to the screw and put it on a, 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 a somewhere. And then three days later, I can't put it back. That system is not complex because mm -hmm. now the parts are not intricately intertwined. Uh, parts are separable, you know, uh, the uh, decomposable they call. Uh, Herb Simon says complex systems are not decomposable. Here is the example, he says. In fact, this moment is not decomposable. We have the future and the history together, okay? In, in, the, in the regular uh, uh, thinking, uh, take a frog. Frog is simpler than, if you look at it, much simpler looking than an airplane or a space station, right? So, okay, I, I challenge you, decompose the frog like you did the airplane into parts. You know, you take one leg here and the eye here and put it out and then put it back next day. See, you can't because they are intricately intertwined. You cannot have the parts separable. So the only way to do uh, engineering of these kind of systems, we use what we call nearly decomposable uh, systems. We call nearly decomposable systems, mm -hmm. which there is uh, objective measures for it. Uh, some guy named Conant, uh, in the uh, maybe 70s or something, he took uh, ideas of Herb Simon and write an entropy-based 
connectivity near decomposability. So he can quantitatively decompose using the communication lines uh, between the nodes of a graph. So you take a problem like frog, like a, a space station or something, uh, put into a network, uh, you discover which parts are nearly decomposable, which means you cannot decompose these two parts as to be together. So, I, uh, yeah. Yeah, many things. So okay. I, I need to go, but uh, it was nice meeting you again. Uh, Thank you, Jader. Right. Appreciate you very much. Hocam, See you. Yeah. Greetings. Bye. I, I, I have a, uh, the time is running out, but uh, I would like to, I think it's uh, quite interesting the way how you approach. Uh, so somehow uh, we use, of course, a lot of mathematical models uh, to explain things, but sometimes somehow we are also the victims of these models because then it uh, gives us some opportunity, but uh, limits our perception. This is uh, so yes. we are actually this is also called somehow in physics symmetry breaking instances where a model breaks down but new model appears. Yes. Uh, yes. So by referring to this new model to natural content, uh, natural uh, experiences like communication, I think it's a very uh, methodologically very insp inspiring way. And also avoiding all these differential equations of infinity uh, gives us a lot of freedom and uh, avoids us discontinuity because discontinuity is bad for, let's say, understanding the whole, let's say, because we have some empty points. My question is, so I, I try to understand, uh, of course, so the Fourier transform makes sense because it's about the channel. A channel brings a, a nice uh, possibility also to not to separate time and space and memory. They are all related in the channel context. The question I have is about this n queen problem. Yeah. So the n queen problem <laughs> has uh, about 92 solutions. So the question right. is, <laughs> you are somehow biased by this n queen problem. So if you would take another uh, problem as origin, <laughs> not n queen problem, which can have also a, a, a communication channel uh, explanation. Yes. Would you yes. end up in a different model? Yes, that's a beautiful question. I hide this for 50 years, Professor. <laughs> 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 you know, a, it, it turns out that answer is no. The reason is no. So we actually, a, I think I can reveal easily these days because a, everything is in the open now. I'm openly discussing. A, but in the past, I did not, a, when I solve problems for Mr. Collins, uh, for example, designing parallel memories. We even publish afterwards uh, that work. Uh, we did not mention the queens, but actually we use queens to design, queen, queen patterns we design. And then when we did the multi-layer circuits, I use queen solutions to design, but didn't mention it. I, I, you know, when you publish it, for example, I say circulant matrices or something like that, hide the values, how we get the results from the queens, you know, pretend we use matrices or something. The reality uh, can be revealed actually is the following. It turns out that there is a guy named Berge, B-E-R-G-E. Uh, graphs and Hypergraphs, very famous book. He is considered the god of graph theory guy. And then he thinks that everything can be represented as graphs and everybody else's work is minimal, is nothing. Mm -hmm. And then he has two examples in his book, two separate chapters. One example yes. is Anquins. Another example is a independent set example, independent set of a graph. Uh, he uses the term stable set. And also he has an example, uh, Shannon's paper. Shannon's uh, zero error capacity paper, which means the maximum capacity of a channel. Uh, there is a formula, how maximum capacity of the channel. He says, Shannon, no, maximum capacity is nothing. You know, this, we turn this to a graph. He takes the channel, he makes the polygon. <laughs> That's what he does. <laughs> From polygon, you know what he does? He calculates 
the stable set number, maximum stable set, he says, ah, Shannon, Shannon, nothing. You know, Shannon equation is essentially uh, this thing, uh, this uh, uh, stable set of this graph. In the other chapter, you know, Gauss gave this problem and Queens, uh, it's nothing. Yeah, this is simple, you know, it's just a graph. He makes a graph and he shows that this is also maximum stable set. And it turns out that maximum stable set on the Queens, maximum stable set on the, uh, the Shannon theorem, same. Mm. So if without calculating the maximum stable set, without, because it is NP complete to solve the general problem and hard right. problem. If I solve the Queens problem, this, all the sequences which I did, 1992, I have, a Queen's paper, you know, published as a Queen's paper, and then we published the most number of problems, uh, solutions in the published literature. To this day, it is the most one. Okay? There is no, no. So you can give me any big number, I can produce the Queen solutions instantaneously with the equation, equation, linear congruence equation I create. So that means I know the solutions, no matter which n, not every n, but Every category of N, I can produce solutions. If I produce solutions, that means I know the stable set. That means I know the, uh, the highest possible precision, finite one, uh, the least action, which means I also know the, uh, the uh, channel capacity, the, that way. So in other words, the key here is, which many years <laughs> kind of disguised, is where the queen solutions match to the, uh, uh, the graph. Uh, least yeah, action. Least action. Sense, of course. Yeah, least action in the, in the, um, uh, the way the Faraday lines go, least action. So I decide the precision, you know, like uh, the distance is 15 uh, meters, let's say, I slice it as many precision as I want, create the queen, about box, they put the solutions that many, for example, in, a, in the case of eight, uh, there are only 12 unique solutions, rotation reflections, the, the others. So I can get uh, uh, 12 solutions and I divide the field into 12 lines. Faraday thinks infinite, you know, no, no need infinite. 12 lines represent uh, the, uh, the field, uh, field uh, what's called the, the, the categorization, yeah. So, That's the uh, yeah, so actually, probably uh, the, uh, the 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 initial bias is not separable. So probably we cannot uh, solve that problem because we live all in this nature and we cannot separate ourselves from nature. So in inside, that sense, out. Inside, inside out, inside out, yeah. Because all yeah. the when you all this equation, and for example, that that double cone, we are inside the double cone. You know, we are looking yeah. inside out, not from outside in. You know, no, God outside. looks from outside in. We look from inside out. Our equations, exactly. you know, imagine a tree, a, a tree. You know, you want to explain tree. You can just look from outside, leaves and stuff. But okay, let me put you inside the tree. And now explain the tree. That's not easy, <laughs> right? <laughs> my, my final question before everybody leaves away, uh, uh, you, you have been searching uh, for the essential, and I also love to find out essential. I always lecture my students. Uh, everything is in its simplest form when you understand the essentials, not, not don't memorize and don't follow the hypes. Yes, but uh, the publication pressure, uh, uh, you know, disables or makes it very difficult for academicians and students to do yes. essential and fundamental very work, uh, even thinking. So uh, it's a big, uh, you know, uh, most people, most uh, science, uh, academicians just follow the trend just yes. to add one more paper in the trend, but never yes. thinking, is this all true? And that's true. What am I? So do you have any advice to survive in this harsh world of publication and still do some useful fundamental work? I, I say that you, whatever is, is interesting you deeply, Never forget that, keep working on that. But at the same time, don't forget 
uh, who brings the bacon? Uh, as the Texan says, you know, the, how are you gonna bring the money to survive and put gas in your car, especially these days, right? Therefore, you have to you have to to some extent follow the trends and then uh, publish enough uh, in those areas uh, and collaborate with great guys if you have a chance. You know, I am so lucky to be uh, around you guys, uh, my wonderful friends like uh, yourself, Dr. Tanju, Stan, Ali, and uh, and many others, and also mentors like Ram and Ye. Without them, uh, I wouldn't have any of these things. They gave me the comfort and the support. As a result, you know, if I need a reference letter, remember I asked you a reference letter for this, uh, this chair position. You know, without those supports, uh, we cannot uh, do this. Same with Nobel Prize. You cannot get Nobel Prize unless you, you, you work with some Nobel guys to nominate you. Nobody can nominate unless you have a Nobel Prize. So I uh, nurture relationships with Wilczek and the uh, Steven Weinberg and, and others. You know, you have to be a uh, high EQ a little bit. You know, you cannot be intelligent all the time. You know, we cannot, I don't consider myself smart because I am compared to my sisters, my brother, I was the slowest guy you know they, they are the best me, me too <laughs> <laughs> so you, you forgot okay. to mention uh Marat, you forgot to mention your wife who has made you keep it real for how long many yeah. years now oh yeah 50 years my <laughs> wife keep me <laughs> she, she wouldn't let you drift off in the never never land right right so my answer on. my answer to <laughs> young young people don't ignore the be aware of the current trends. I was, I was continuously reading the literature. And if I could, what you can use these kind of ideas, basic ideas, if you have some, as a, as a fire in you to apply some of those things. If you don't have that, then you just use a, essentially programming. You know, from computer guys, you have to write programs. You know, you have to be proficient in some programming, you have these days, for example, minimally proficient either MATLAB or Mathematica, plus one programming language. That should be your goal. If you don't have programming language skill, you can, I, when Queens, I couldn't do it. You know, Gauss couldn't do it. Why Gauss cannot do it? He didn't have computer. So you have to learn one programming language incredibly good. And then one package like MATLAB, Mathematica, one of those, packages you have to otherwise you cannot survive okay thank you very much i appreciate very much your contribution uh, so uh, i wish you all the best and everybody uh, who participated to this presentation and also i i like to thank rabia bilgiju for her uh, arrangement of this uh, seminar bye bye take care thank you very much i appreciate it